everybody and welcome. We're going to give a few moments to those who are just joining before we get started. So you are right on time. And again, we're just going to wait a few moments while everybody logs in, and then we'll go ahead and get started. So thank you for joining us today. Okay. Well, again, thank you and, and welcome everybody. I know people are still joining the session. Uh, that will probably happen for the next moment or two, but we're gonna go ahead and get started. So first off, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to our special webinar today. This is an MSM Think In US event hosted by M Square Media. Uh, my name is Dr. George Kasenga. I'm the current Assistant Vice President of University Partnerships, and I'll be the moderator for today's event. Uh, just as a, a quick housekeeping item, I want you to know that towards the end of the session, the last 15 to 20 minutes, we are going to dedicate to your Q&A. Uh, so please prepare to have questions. We are here to, to try and provide answers for you. But also within the Zoom platform, you can see that there is a Q&A option. Please feel free to submit your questions there in, in writing, and then we will address them either in writing or in um, we will speak them live to everybody to hear those answers. Uh, but just want to make sure you know that we have the last uh, 10 to or 15 to 20 minutes dedicated to Q&A. Um, so again, I'm very excited for today's topic. We're going to be covering a very timely theme, which is a localized approach to recruitment in Africa. Today's webinar is another installment, again, of the Think in US event, which aims to shed light on some of the important matters and issues surrounding higher education um, and international education in the United States. Each thinking event will focus on a specific discussion point. It will feature guest speakers and thought leaders in the industry, and we will then share insights and provide clarity regarding opportunities for the sustainable growth of partners uh, for our partners and stakeholders. Before I proceed with introductions of our speakers, however, I'd like to also take this opportunity to thank our host today, MSM. Um, so MSM, or M Square Media, is an education management company that works with partner institutions across Canada and the United States and other countries throughout the world. I'd like to thank MSM for hosting an event like this so we can have all, all have a, a better opportunity and chance to better serve the needs of all of the international educators around the world. Today's thinking event will tackle a particular issue that higher education institutions in the United States have faced in the last two years due to the pandemic. With international enrollment numbers declining, and the decreased student mobility affecting campus operations and sustainability, understanding how to optimize recruitment in African nations is essential for, for many, if not most of us. Our special guests for today will share information about the current situation and discuss the different opportunities in regards to having a localized approach to recruitment throughout the continent of Africa. We're also grateful that our panelists, uh, we're grateful to them for joining us today's event. Uh, we're excited to hear and learn from their knowledge on the different subject topics or matters that we'll be discussing today um, and all of their experience in relation to, the, to today's theme. So our expert panelists today have with them years of experience in Africa's higher education sector. Both of them are joining us today to share their insights and ideas on the topic of building and maintaining a localized approach to recruitment in Africa. Our first guest has served as a commercial specialist for the U.S. Commercial Services the trade promotion arm of the U.S. Department of Commerce's International Trade Administration in the Durban area of South Africa since 2014. His role involves providing a range of services to U.S. businesses interested in doing business in Southern Africa, as well as to South African businesses interested in importing U.S. products and services. The commercial service works closely with over 100 domestic offices in the U.S., and is well supported by various regional teams, of which Sanjay is the regional team lead for education. Before that, Sanjay had worked as a general manager in education and worked various IT and recruitment roles. He holds a bachelor degree, or excuse me, a bachelor of arts degree in international relations and political science from the University of Witwatersrand. Friends, let us also welcome, or let us welcome commercial specialist Sanjay Hari Prasad. Thank you so much for being here today. Our next resource speaker holds a master's degree in business administration and is a seasoned higher education management professor, professional and sales enablement expert with over 13 years of progressive experience in marketing, sales and international student recruitment for institutional partnerships across the United Kingdom, Canada, the USA, and Australia. As a senior recruitment manager, he has facilitated end-to-end -end cycle of student recruitment and enrollments and has maintained high satisfaction scores among diverse stakeholders and channel partners in Africa. Let us welcome here with us today, MSM's regional sales head for Africa, 
Ikena Mbakogu. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Judge, and great being here. Excellent. Well, again, thank you to our special guests for joining us today. And without further ado, let's please uh, jump into our Think In session. We're really eager to hear, uh, now that we've established your, your expertise, we're eager to hear what you have to, to share with us. Uh, you know, first off for Sanjay, what are your thoughts on the affordability of international education and the financial capacity of students from Africa in terms of studying in the United States? Hi, and um, you know, it's just a pleasure uh, just at the top uh, for me to be a part of this uh, great initiative. Um, from, from our side, what we're seeing is, and I think it's been exacerbated by the, by the pandemic um, that's gripped the continent and in fact the world for the last 24 months, um, is that a lot of the countries have uh, in Africa have been plunged into uh, recession and uh, their economy is having negative growth. Um, that has uh, put a strain on resources um, we're seeing the depreciation of African currency versus the US dollar, uh, which makes studying um, in the United States um, a lot more expensive, um, uh, you know, for, for, for the traditional African student. And when you factor into, um, you know, the other factor that um, there isn't a lot of uh, scholarship uh, programs available for African students to study outside of Africa, um, you know, what that means is that uh, the bulk of the cost is being managed by, uh, you know, the families, the students themselves, um, you know, th through their life savings. So, so that puts a, a lot of strain, um, you know, for the uh, African student to study in the United States. Um, what I can say is that um, there is a great appetite for African students to want to study in the United States. I think recent studies show that... Um, uh, the United States is still one of the more popular destinations uh, for African students who can afford to study uh, abroad, uh, choose to. Um, so, you know, whilst we have this uh, financial obstacle, you know, there are ways in which that we can look at uh, sort of mitigating it. And uh, I think we'll, as we get into the conversation a little bit more, we'll, we'll unpack uh, what some of those uh, mitigating factors are. No, thank you so much for that, Sanjay. And uh, how about Ikena? Is there anything more that you would add or an additional reaction you have to that? Yeah, um, obviously the, the pandemic, the COVID-19 has really even made um, recruitment quite very strenuous for institutions uh, because, you know, accessibility, you know, you know, students can't travel, you know, restrictions here and there. So that even makes it a lot even more difficult, you know, for international students. Coupled with the fact that um, you know economies you know almost shut down you know people lost their jobs you know families you know and traditionally in Africa it's not just one child there are you know two or three or four so you know most you know students who had the intention of you know wanting to study abroad you know everything was just um, crashed and then focused on studying you know in the country so some of all these factors really contributed you know to increasing the cost of, you know, attendance at a U.S. institution. And, um, yeah, so I just touched a little bit on, you know, in terms of we being able to talk about some of the mitigating factors in the cost of the conversation. So, yeah. No, thank you for that. And, you know, just last week, you know, Hall and IQ had an article that, you know, for anyone who wants to seek it out, the, the title is 196 billion international education market is going to increase to 433 billion by 2030. And one of the items that they, they highlighted is that just from Africa and Asia alone, but they were emphasizing Africa, they're saying that, you know, 75% of the, the 1 billion additional students seeking post-secondary education are going to be coming from those two, those two markets. So that's substantial growth. So that, like you're saying right now, that interest and capacity out of Africa um, is, is growing and we need to position ourselves in the U.S. to, you know, be present and be an option and provide the services that are going to be attractive for these, inst uh, for these students. Uh, you know, and I jumped to this notion of, of services because, um, you know, now I'd like to know your thoughts on higher education in, in America. What, what are the important services that institutions should be providing to students from, from African nations? And I know it's a full continent. So, of course, you know, it, it may vary by country or even by region within country. Um, but 
there are likely some differentiating elements just from, from African nations versus the students that we may have traditionally recruited from other parts of the world. Um, I can I know, or Ikenna, if you're willing to speak to that topic first. Yeah, um, the US has always and traditionally, you know, been a top destination for international students. You know, it attracts a lot of students around the world. And just to give a little bit of perspective, you know, um, to the number of students that go to study in the US, um, um, Education USA, um, you know, put it at about 900,000 students across the world. And out of that 900,000 from Africa, just above 40,000, you know, from Sub-Saharan Africa. So that's really um, a very good um, and attractive thing for the US. And obviously they didn't grow overnight, you know, to be able to, you know, get to that fit. Um, the US has set themselves, you know, the higher education system in the US, they've set themselves, you know, um, to be an attractive destination where they offer superior quality education in a very flexible environment. And we can attest to the fact that even the US is in terms of cultural diversity, it's one of the really multicultural environments, you know, with abundant opportunities. Um, another good thing, you know, in terms of, you know, the higher education aspect of the US, you know, just to buttress a bit, is that um, the, the institutions are really top ranked. And obviously so many students want to go to top ranked schools, you know, they are really, you know, in terms of the world rankings, they're already, already there. And there are loads of courses, you know, very deep portfolio of, you know, programs for international students to choose from. And even sometimes the flexibility of these students, you know, um, pursuing such degrees without even declaring a major is one key, you know, um, advantage of the US and attracts a lot of um, interest. Um, to go away a little bit about, away from the institutional system of the US, um, Sanjay talked, up, talked about the US dollar. US has, the dollar is quite very strong in a very strong economy. And when we compare that aspect to, you know, the African continent, it's a very wide gap, you know, in terms of, you know, how African students will be able to match, you know, the cost of attendance. And this is particularly even um, a bit more serious when these students have to pay out of state tuition fees you know, in institutions in the US, you know, um, you know, at present, almost, if not um, a very big number of, you know, inborn students from Africa, certainly uh, will always require substantial financial aid. And costing has always been a big barrier, you know, to their choice, you know, of where to study. Yeah, we could um, exclude a, a little bit of uh, the very affluent, you know, aspect of, you know, some of the Africans, but a chunk of the students will need financial aid. And that's one service um, um, institutions in the US should really focus on. Uh, because if they really want to attract the best students, you know, across the world, and there are loads of, you know, very bright, talented, promising students in Africa, you know, having a substantial financial aid, you know, system in the universities will always help them um, attract some of all the students from Africa. Uh, I've been into you know, a lot of recruitment activities across Sub-Saharan Africa. I interact with students, the parents, you know, we have sessions, they talk about you know, what they want. And a majority of you know, students will vocalize and they will tell you that you know, the tuition fee, you know, it's one of the main issues you know, for determining where they want to study and how they'll study in the US. And um, to be frank with you, um, Institutions in the US do have scholarships, but then, you know, they tend to spread it across a lot of students just to be able to capture, you know, the market, which is good on its, on, on its own, obviously uh, being a little bit generous. But then we have such um, limited, you know, scholarships of financial aid because it's very limited compared to the, you know, huge numbers coming from Africa. Um, at the end of the day, you spread it across so many students and you don't even capture anyone because, um, some of the students do not even have what it takes. You know, they don't have the financial strength, you know, to be able to make up that difference, you know, um, from what the institution, you know, has given to the students. You know, just to explain a little bit, um, you know, for instance, an institution given a 30,000, you know, scholarship, you know, across five students at $5,000, you know, 
rather than give it, you know, 5,000 each, give it to one student and we know we can capture the student. And that's one good um, service institutions can really give um, African students. Um, when it comes to also communication, you know, parents are always the decision makers, you know, for, um, you know, your students, you know, to choose a university. And increasingly there has been this aspect of safety, you know, in the US. So institutions should create forums to be able to, you know, get parents into conversations, especially around, you know, accommodation options, just to let them have that certainty of how that institution, you know, is really taking security, you know, um, you know, as a priority. And then finally, you know, testing, you know, testing is, is something that most students do not want, you know, to engage in before enrolling into a school. When I mean testing, things like, you know, providing your, you know, additional, uh, you know, certified tests like SAT, GMAT, you know, IELTS or TOEFL, you know, some of these are huge barriers and institutions can be a little bit flexible in providing some, you know, um, you know, waivers, you know, for international students from Africa to be able to help them, you know, you know, get away from that hurdle of some of the, you know, challenges. So some of these are quite very um, instrumental to, you know, give African students, you know, especially wanting to diversify, if institutions want to diversify that, you know, um, their, their campuses to be able to attract some of the best, you know, brands here in Africa. So one of the strategies that many universities will employ is taking what scholarship dollars they have and maybe applying them to the first or first and second year of a student's experience. You know, from the school's perspective, they think once a student's there, they may be able to find the resources so that they graduate from that institution. Can you speak to what would be the impact on a student, um, a typical student from an African nation, if their scholarship was only a freshman or sophomore year scholarship? And then it then it was revoked, or at least it, it terminated. That was the full length of the scholarship. Would that have a particular? I mean, from what you're describing, I would expect it to have a negative impact for these students. But I wanted to hear from either Sanjay or Ikena on that strategy. Yeah, um, you know, I, I think Ikena uh, touched on it. Um, any scholarship needs to be for the duration of uh, the course that a student is enrolled for. Um, that is going to lead to a greater throughput. Um, within the educational system. And what we're seeing um, is that when um, scholarships are completed after the first year or the first two years or the associate degree component of, uh, of their study, um, the student invariably uh, drops out of the system completely. Um, so that is a big issue. Um, you know, I think um, recruiting a student from Africa represents two challenges. One is to firstly, get them into the system. And then the second issue is keeping them in the system so that uh, you know, the university and the student can continue to grow um, and get the full um, student experience. Um, so any scholarship program has to be for the full duration of, of, uh, of the student's uh, tuition um, at that university. Mm -hmm. Do you concur? Yeah, I totally agree I with that. Okay. Yeah, I totally Perfect. agree with that. You know, the, the present practice is just for the first year, you know, and, and obviously these students don't have the funds. That's why they requested for the scholarship in the first place, right? So you're taking that away, you know, halfway, you're already setting up the students, you know, to drop out. And that really is going to, you know, result in high, you know, very, uh, very low retention rates for African students in the universities. So yeah, spot on. Okay. Well, now here's a, another interesting question, I think for both of our panelists, is there a volume or you know, a population of students interested in studying in the United States that is high enough that it, it justifies the cost of recruitment? Uh, and I'll elaborate on that in a minute, but you know, the, the cost of student acquisition and return on investment, these are important themes that our US institutions are, are looking at. They often have limited recruitment dollars. And so they want to, for active recruitment, they want to go to places where they're likely to get the highest return on that investment um, and, and yield the most number of students that they can. But this also goes up against um, goals for academic, uh, you know, academic diversity of the programs our students are interested in, geographic diversity of country of origin. These things are healthy for our, our campus student body. So again, is, is there enough volume of students in, in African nations? And maybe you can speak to, to which ones or how you would target them um, to justify that cost of recruitment. And despite the challenges, 
um, why would you say it's worth the effort to recruit in in, in Africa as a whole? Um, and maybe, you know, between Akina and, and Sanjay, maybe Sanjay, if you could go first to speak to that topic. Yeah, well, um, you know, I, I can, you know, we might have to set up a, another session just on, on this topic. Sure. Um, why recruiting in Africa? Um, you know, I think as the as you touched on it, the the study that uh, that came out recently from Holland IQ, um, you know, shows that um, the sheer volume of students that are going to be coming out of this continent um, in the, in the next ten years uh, warrants um, you know U.S. universities uh, spend time recruiting on the continent, um, and there are ways in which we can mitigate. Um, the costs and try to keep the costs low. Um, the, f firstly, you know, contrary to opinion, um, Africa is not just one uh, landmass. It's it's it consists of uh, 45 countries, um, which are close enough for you to travel to more than one destination. Um, and uh, you know, we we realize that traveling from the United States to Africa um, is uh, an expensive uh, investment. Um, and you want to get return on investment. So what we always advocate um, is that when you do come to the continent, you come and you visit at least two or three countries um, and get exposure to two or three different markets, um, which can help mitigate your, your costs and give you a greater return on investment. That's the one thing. The second thing is, is looking at ways in which you recruit. Um, I think what the pandemic has um, highlighted for us all is that you can do things virtually, and uh, you know through virtual engagement, um, you don't necessarily need to come to the continent to recruit students. Uh, you just need to make sure that um, the communication you have with students is constant and effective um, through the various uh, media that that students find popular. Uh, Africa um, is probably the youngest continent in the world. Um, it is a very mobile driven uh, market. Um, there's lots of engagement on social media platforms, uh, WhatsApp, WeChat, um, Telegram. Um, there's many ways in which you can communicate effectively with a student without necessarily using the traditional forms of uh, um, you know, email and, and, um, and phone calls. Um, so it's, you, know, you can um, communicate with your students. Um, another factor um, that I can do on, on return on investment, and I see um, one of our colleagues um, actually put this on the chat, so I'll, I'll just deal with this now, is about uh, the community college system and two-year colleges. I think in Africa, there is a uh, lack of awareness uh, across the board, across all the markets, about the two-year college system and the two plus two transfer agreements. I don't think it's well understood. I think so, uh, Africa, when they think about studying in the United States, they think about studying at you know the popular uh, campuses, um, and you know these campuses, without naming them, um, are very expensive to study in. And I think that is where the two plus two um, transfer agreement and the college system, community college system rather, can play a big part in it because it helps lower the costs for the first two years um, and um, gets the student into the system at an affordable level. Um, and I think that is something that uh, maybe the more traditional universities, the four-year universities can look at, is that when they come to recruit um, into the markets, they bring along um, you know, some of the community colleges that they have articulation agreements with um, so that we can start creating an awareness about the system that you can study at our university in years three and four and graduate. Um, and it's, um, you know, you still get the same level of education um, in your first two years. Um, so, you know, that is for me, uh, you know, critical as well that, that we create awareness in the market about that. Um, Ikena, um, is, there, is there anything you want to add? Yeah, um, you, you rightly said, you know, in terms of, you know, the, the volume of students that we could be potentially getting out from Africa in the next 10 years, knowing that um, in Africa, Africa has one of the very, you know, young population, you know, compared to the rest of the world. Also, you know, understanding that economies are, you know, you know um, picking up, 
you know, some of them are underdeveloped, but in the coming years, uh, economies will pick up and definitely uh, opportunities to be able to afford, you know, um, US education, it's will be there. Um, another um, very good way for universities to really mitigate or reduce the cost of uh, recruitment in Africa is to have in-country representatives, you know. Um, the UK is very good in doing this, you know. So, you know, travel from the UK universities is almost eliminated because there are in-country staff, you know, who understands the region, understands the students, understand the key markets and, you know, the, the whole entire recruitment circle and be able to harness such opportunities. You know, having, you know, in-country representatives you know, whether be it, you know, as an individual staff or, you know, as an organization, it's a very um, key aspect looking at, you know, this, the, um, the, this, you know, the large size of Africa and you can just come cover it in a week or two weeks, you know, trip. Mm -hmm. um, also, um, most institutions, you know, uh, you know, bundle Africa as one and, you know, just putting all the programs together. But there's a lot of, um, you know, targeted marketing that could be done, you know, which could, you know, go along the lines of program offerings, you know, that are specific to, you know, different markets based on demand. Um, I've recruited a lot of students, you know, in West Africa, uh, Nigeria, it's one of the biggest and number one um, senders of, you know, you know, students, you know, to US. And I must say, you know, um, the STEM disciplines are, are really a demand uh, for students, you know, you know, engineering, you know, number one, and the business programs, you know, and health related, you know, um, uh, you know, subjects. So if institutions can really stay, um, sit back a little bit and design a very well, you know, you know, curated approach with some of these in-demand programs, you know, in specific markets, um, Nigeria health related programs would be a very key um, aspect. And then add and be very vocal about the affordability and possibly um, the availability of, you know, financial aid scholarships. You know, this will really help in, you know, targeting and getting those students that, um, you know, will be able to help in getting a very good return on investment and, you know, reducing the cost of acquisition. So that's also something that institutions could look at, you know, having an in-country presence you know, you know, targeted marketing, you know, in terms of, you know, the programs and perhaps, you know, um, having a little bit more, you know, vocality, you know, you know, be able to talk about, I've got scholarship for you. I've got, you know, financial aid, you know, you know for students and perhaps have it on their website. Um, Sanjay, you mentioned, you know, uh, um, you know, students being a little bit on their phones, you know, so many websites sometimes are not so easily accessible on the phone. You know, it's quite difficult, the user interface a bit, you know, um, not as exciting for the kind of students, you know, we're attracting 17 and 20s, you know, of age. So institutions should also have that in mind, you know, making very um, mobile friendly websites, engaging students, you know, on social media, Facebook, you know, rather than Zoom. Zooms, yeah, they're very good, but they consume a lot of data, you know, but, you know, having sessions on Facebook, you know, Instagram, that's well, can, weird, to, that's to your point space. there, one of the things I, I've seen be successful for, for many universities is creating a landing page within their broader website that is that does not demand a lot of data, that is actually quite simple so that people right. in different areas, that, that we use that website to promote the institution um, when we're in market so that students can get the relevant information on their phone without, it's not graphically intense, it's just relevant to what right. those students need. So to recap some of what you were saying, you kind of, um, you know, there's a need to match your program offerings to market demand, and that could be a whole additional session on how to do that. But there's a lot of intelligence out there for understanding, you know, is it grad or undergrad? Are we focused on STEM or business? Is it a, um, are we looking for PhDs or masters? All those types of things. So I definitely hearing that. Also, the, the value of that in-country representation when you can have it, um, which is something MSM does, which I, I, I value, lets people have that constant presence when they're not able to travel all of the time to these different markets. But also from the, the U.S. commercial service, you know, I, I have used, you know, I've been in the, the recruitment side for international students for, you know, over 20 years at this point. 
I've benefited from the U.S. Commercial Services Gold Key Service. So Sanjay, I don't know if you could at least mention that. And I know you, you shared with me earlier a pretty exciting initiative you're doing that's more in the virtual reality space that I hoped you could talk, on, talk about for just a minute. Yeah, sure. Um, just to, to quickly touch on what Ikenna said um, regarding in-country representation. I think the cheapest, most cost-effective way of having income in a country representation is having an effective uh, alumni uh, network um, and getting them to work for you. Uh, what I've seen very successful, some of the universities that have been successful in recruitment on this continent has been, um, their alumni have been very active in actually going out and, and recruiting. Um, before I touch on to the services, um, a lot of universities also uh, with our State Department colleagues and our public affairs program, um, they have the Fulbright Scholarship um, uh, program, which, which allows them to bring um, a US subject matter expert from a higher education university um, over to, to, to Africa um, to be a guest lecturer. Um, and again, you know, that is a great way of entering the market um, as an academic. You know, the students get to see the value that you can bring and, and the enhanced learning um, that they can get. And uh, a lot of schools use the Fulbright scholarship and then whilst their uh, uh, representative is in country, um, they actually do a bit of outreach and recruitment as well. So, you know, those are some of the ways. Um, uh, George, you mentioned our goal key service. Our goal key service for those of you who do not know is one where you, we would uh, bring you to, to uh, South Africa, because I'm based in South Africa, for example, but it's available uh, throughout the continent. We'll bring you to a country that, that you're interested in. And we will set up meetings with school counselors, uh, student coordinators, and high school students, uh, usually grade 10, 11, and 12 uh, students so that you can meet and engage with them and have many uh, recruitment fairs. Um, what we do is, again, uh, to make it cost effective for you is that we're very target focused um, in, in how we go about uh, choosing those schools. So we would choose and, and target you to visit schools, um, mostly from the private school network uh, on the continent. Um, these are schools that um, if you look at two of the major obstacles uh, for an African student, it's firstly academic uh, qualifications, um, you know, the uh, use of the English, their command of the English language, um, as, as well as um, financial. Um, by going to these private schools, um, these schools usually have English as their medium of instruction. Uh, so English is not an issue uh, in terms of being able to learn. And they come from a background, an affluent background, as Akina may have touched on, where these students um, also come from families where they put a premium on, on their child's education. Um, you know, Akina mentioned that uh, parents are critical to the, to the cycle. Uh, you can't just simply engage with the student. Uh, because of the cost factor, you have to engage with the parents. Um, and this allows us to be a lot more focused. Uh, when we do the recruitment phase, we would often not just invite students, but we would invite interested parents as well. Um, and, and that's you know, some of the ways in which we, we focus our approach. Um, from a virtual perspective, uh, we're excited that we'll be launching um, in a month's time, um, the long awaited Africa VR project. Um, that is where we've, uh, we've gone out to high schools um, and we've invited students, each student who participates in the program receives a virtual reality cardboard headset um, through which they can then take uh, virtual tours of campuses. And as soon as they, they register, we capture their data, um, they get to um, you know, experience what it's like you know, touring a campus and the engagement process um, can begin between the school and the student. Um, they take away the cardboard goggles, but when they come to the American corners, um, which are available throughout the continent, uh, through our public affairs people, um, they get to use the Oculus Pro headsets. So it's a fully immersive VR experience. And it's something that, um, you know, we're quite excited to launch. And again, um, you know, uh, it saves the, 
the university the trouble of having to come to to Africa because we are doing the recruitment for you on the ground. Um, yeah, so, that's it for me. That's, no, I really appreciate that. And you know, you've touched on some obstacles, uh, but also we're getting into the area of some solutions. Um, but you know, again, Sanjay and Ikena, please chime in. What are some additional obstacles and solutions in terms of traveling and setting up education fairs that, that match up with local recruitment? Because things I've heard you saying already are, sure, there's the gold key service and that's an opportunity to, to get in and to get exposure to, to multiple markets within one trip and, and learn about what it means to, to recruit in Africa in that way. But also, um, you know, you talked about parents. My understanding is that in for many African nations, it is a longer recruitment cycle than the US um, schools may be accustomed to in terms of, we might think within 12 to 18 months, that is a, a reasonable typical recruitment cycle. But I think for our students coming out of Africa, it's much longer because parents and really extended family are involved. So I was hoping someone could touch on that. Also, you know, how does the academic calendar line up in Africa? When's the right time to recruit? Because the college fairs that we may be accustomed to, to doing around the world might not match with, with Africa. Um, and also, I know there was a question in the chat box, but if anybody can speak to the themes related to language proficiency um, and, and what that means, because I think sometimes our students from certain African countries get frustrated when they're asked to take a TOEFL or an IELTS or a similar language exam. Um, but for many schools, there's a need to that. Can either, either of you speak to, to any of those topics? Yeah, uh, I can, if you don't mind, I, I can go yeah. first. Yeah, I'll go first. Uh, Thank you. Sure. Um, so, yeah, uh, it is a much longer sales cycle. Um, it, dealing with uh, parents, it's it's a big decision, you know, as I think I've, I've touched on, um, you know, agreeing to get your, your child to study in the United States. Um, so the process is constant. Uh, it needs constant engagement, constant, clear, transparent communication um, with the both parties. Um, so that's key. Uh, when we look at the academic calendar, the academic calendar in Africa, by and large, does not sync with, um, you know, the academic calendar for higher education institutes in the United States. Um, the mean recruitment time is different. Uh, the, the optimum recruitment time in sub-Saharan Africa is between February and April. Um, and so, uh, you know, the fall uh, recruitment cycle uh, for the United States. That is when you will get um, better access to students. Um, you know, when we go uh, towards the end of the year, September, October, students are gearing up for examinations. Um, the high schools are very reluctant um, to have uh, schools come in and, and present, um, you know, and that's just not, that's not, just uh, for international schools. Um, that's also for the local universities. Um, so everybody sort of uh, towards the beginning of the year in the second quarter, February to April, um, that's sort of the, the mean recruitment time. Um, Ikena, do you have anything to add? Yeah, um, you spot on, on talking about the recruitment circle. Um, in addition to the recruitment circle, you know, um, some of the very good um, ways you know, institutions can really, you know, target Africa, you know, um, just talk about, you know, in terms of, you know, the English proficiency, that's always a very big barrier. Uh, English is the main language of instruction for most, you know, Anglophone countries in Africa. In fact, you know, some of the students, you know, institutions in the US target attend some of the very top, you know, um, high schools in, in Africa with British curriculum and even you know, American curriculum taught sometimes by American teachers. And sometimes these students will still be required you know, to um, provide you know, um, some of all these tests. And these are very big you know, obstacles. And as I mentioned in my, you know, in my other statement that flexibility around all this is the key. Yeah, we're not saying eliminate all of that, because definitely sometimes this could help to sieve out the kind of, you know, um, students, the quality of students you're looking at. But then, you know, that should be a way to be able to have a flexibility or around, you know, trying to know what students we should be um, um, having these testings, you know, as requirements. So that's something that is a very um, big obstacle and having the flexibility is a good um, solution. And yeah, you know, Parents, you know, it's not just parents, you know, sometimes 
you know, friends, friends are very influential, you know, um, for students, you know, there's a very close knit community, um, you know, parents in an organization, in a company, students from the same high school, you know, in the same church, you know, all these factors, you know, creates that long recruitment circle. So um, using alumni, you know, um, you know, uh, I always tell some of the university partners I work with, you know, once you're bringing, you know, marketing um, information in country, try to always feature someone from that country, you know, that provides the connectivity. Oh, I know him. Oh, I, I, he went to the high school. So th there's that connection. And that alone can really, you know, provide a very good inroad to acceptability of that institution and being able to, you know, get some very good recruitment from Africa. Well, so thank you for these responses. I want to get to the Q and A because I see the questions coming in. I have two last questions um, that I just want to take a minute or two to get your your reactions to, and then we're going to shift to the Q and A. Um, you know, but lastly, one of the questions I wanted to touch on, you know, is Africa an agent driven market? You know, and maybe that varies by country. But can you speak to a little bit about? You know, recruitment agencies are, um, you know, a, a common part of the many modalities universities use to recruit students. What, what does that look like in Africa, if you can speak to that? And then if there's time, I want to get to the Q&A, of course, but I'm also interested, you know, what more can institutions do to ensure a smooth transition for our, our students coming from African nations in, into the U.S.? But, but first, let's, let's talk about African nation, or excuse me, the agents in Africa. Then I'm going to switch to Q&A, and then I'll introduce that other question if there's time. Um, so I don't know, I, uh, I kind of, could you speak first to the, if they're the agent's presence in Africa, and then I'll ask Sanjay for his response. Yeah, um, Africa is very, um, is very dependent on the agent system. Um, not all of Africa, Nigeria and, and Kenya to a very large extent, you know, very dependent on, you know, agents to a low extent, Ghana. Um, so um, recruiting from these countries, um, it's always going to be, you know, via an agent. Um, this could be good in one, on one part and uh, perhaps also not good. Um, good in the sense that it's easy for institutions to target, you know, a group of, you know, select few, you know, and get, get all the information and try to get the students. Uh, um, from the student perspective, and I think just also um, um, really um, less is fear on, from the chat, you know, in terms of visas, you know, because the agents are so dominant, um, they tend to do almost everything for the students, you know, down to, you know, selection of schools, down to trying to know what course or program they want to study. So the students tend to be so reliant on agents. And then they will be saddled with a hurdle to go for an interview because you need to go to defend why you want to study in the United States. You didn't do research, you depended on the agent, agent fed you all the information. So they do not have that um, um, competence to really speak to the visa officer as to why you know, they want to study in X, Y university as against another university. So that's that disconnect. So you could see a student has very good grades, SAT, top notch, all right? You know, perhaps a little bit of comfortable financial background, you know, but then he's not eloquent enough to defend why he wants to study in the US or why he chose X university over X university or what he's going to do with this program and how it fits into his career because everything was all done for agent for the student because it was such an easy way so and from these countries you have higher visa refusal huge dependence on agents nigeria you know kenya ghana versus you know countries like Cote d'Ivoire, you know um senegal you know these are quite you know um, other countries that though there are refusals but not as high as you know um nigeria ghana and kenya so this you could, we could be able to draw some you know similarities or conclusion that Agents very good for the institution, but then it may not really be in good interest for students. And I um, just because of time, um, I, I think I'll just leave it at that. Thank you for that. Thank you for that response. Yeah, we do have a couple of questions right on deck. But Sanjay, was there anything more you wanted to add before I jumped into the questions? Yeah, you know, uh, working for for the U.S. government, um, there is a strong translation between um, markets where there's a very active agent uh, market. Um, there's invariably a higher visa refusal rate um, versus markets like South Africa, for example, where it's not an agent driven market, but the, the visa acceptance rate is a lot higher. And uh, I think that lends itself to the fact that um, uh, recruitment agents tend to 
uh, bring in the numbers for schools. Um, so they might not necessarily be as focused um, in terms of their outreach um, as, as perhaps they should be and trying to almost put square pegs into round holes. Uh, I mean, they do a great job, uh, don't get me wrong, but I think, um, you know, when you're trying to fill in a, uh, a set quota of, of students, um, you know, you tend to sort of push students through who aren't necessarily ready to, to go through the whole visa application process. Um, you know, I can have mentioned, um, students have to be able to, to vindicate and, uh, you know, clarify for themselves um, to the uh, consular officer uh, why they want to study in the United States. And, and often, you know, when they deal with agents, agents sort of take care of everything um, and uh, the students uh, aren't re don't necessarily give the necessary thought process to, to, the, to the interview and think just because they're working with an agent, they're guaranteed to study in the US, which unfortunately is not the case. Okay, thank you for those responses. Let me jump into some of the questions that our participants are, are posting in the Q&A feature. The first one comes from William Heinemann. He says, are African students interested in studying at HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities? Might these institutions have an advantage if they are well-ranked and have good STEM programs? Um, are either of you able to address that? It's a great question. Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I can tell you that there is a great appetite um, for students wanting to study um, at HBCUs, HBSUs. Um, purely the Black Lives Matter uh, movement has uh, sort of highlighted, um, you know, the awareness uh, to want to study in institutes like this. And uh, there is a great appetite. Uh, when we talk about STEM, I think across the continent, uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, um, all the countries are going through uh, as they're gearing for what they call the fourth industrial revolution. Um, STEM is a huge uh, part of that. Um, and, um, you know, certainly I think uh, if schools um, are leading or, or have leading faculties within STEM, um, they become an attractive proposition for students on the continent. Thank you for that. Um, the next question is, how can universities participate in the initiative, Sanjay, that you talked about regarding the, the virtual tours? If, if, if they have a virtual tour at their university, is there someone they should be reaching out to or what, what's the best step for them? Yeah, they need to uh, contact uh, myself um, and uh, we can chat uh, separately. Uh, we still have a few spots uh, open. So, um, you know, the sooner they get a hold of me, the better. And uh, yeah, yeah, we'll see how we can accommodate the virtual tour program. Uh, we're ring fencing it for 20 schools only um, for a six month period. Um, and then we're looking at refreshing that and bringing in another 20 schools thereafter. So if they're not part of the first uh, tranche of schools, uh, they certainly will be the second tranche. Okay. And for those looking, I know your information was on one of the, the earlier slides. Do you mind putting your email or your contact in the, in the chat box for everybody? Yeah, I think uh, May has uh, just done that for me. Thanks, May, May is on top of things. Thank you for that. That simplified <laughs> that. Now, another question yeah. came in from, from Barbara. She asks, are, are either MSM or the U.S. Commercial Service, are you hosting any um, traveling recruiters this year and, and where and when? I know within, within MSM, and you kind of certainly elaborate, you know, with our partners, we do a lot in terms of concierge service to help, you know, put together very in, in effective recruitment tours. Um, but I'll let both of you speak to that from, from your respective positions regarding hosting traveling recruiters, where and when, what's that process for them? Maybe Sanjay first? Yeah, um, we don't have any plans at the moment. Um, so uh, to host a delegation uh, of uh, US universities uh, to come to, to uh, the continent. Uh, I know our Education USA colleagues are working on it, um, you know, they've had uh, delegations uh, which we've supported, um, so they've done the recruitment, um, but, uh, you know, uh, that will certainly be going, but that will be coming from Education USA. From us as the Department of Commerce, um, we will continue to uh, focus on the virtual uh, tour program, um, as well as, uh, you know, the services that we offer, the Gold Key service, 
um, and the partner search, uh, which is another one of our services for you. Um, so, you know, if a school is interested in coming to South Africa, uh, again, contact us and uh, we can uh, tailor make a, a, a trip for you um, that's, that's to, that suits your needs. Um, yeah, uh, Ikenna? Yeah, um, thanks, Sanjay. Um, for, for MSM, obviously, we, we have in country, you know, representatives in most of the African countries. And, you know, for such, you know, situations, you know, if the institution can come, you know, um, for such, you know, recruitment fairs, we have so many fairs, you know, in that, that we organize with agents, with, you know, schools, really top schools, you know, there's so much, there's so, so much opportunities for that. Uh, if the institutions can come, yeah, perfect. But then, you know, as I mentioned, to reduce the cost of acquisition, you know, we are on ground. I'm presently in Nigeria, Lagos, to be able to facilitate some of all these, you know, fairs on behalf of institutions, as well as, you know, MSM's um, very robust, you know, network of, you know, in-country agents. Um, and so, yeah, so this is our ongoing, this is the period of fairs, you know, this is the period of recruitment in Africa between February and April. So there are lots of, you know, educational, you know, and affairs happening in schools, you know, and then um, we are here, you know, to be able to facilitate that. And if any institution can make it, yeah, good and fine. Great. Now we have three more, three more questions that come in. Each are, are really interesting and I think relevant to everybody. Uh, one question is, we've heard, um, this is JC asking, we've heard from Education USA staff that in Nigeria, students aren't issued visas to attend their university because the students don't appear academically prepared or serious about attending. Education USA encouraged the school to consider requiring the SAT for admission so students can demonstrate that they are indeed serious about attending. Um, that school, however, struggles with students just getting visas to attend overall. Um, are there any suggestions on this front? And yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. for education, you say, you know, I can understand their perspective on that, but so many schools, you know, there, there are, they are no longer requiring the SAT for a variety of reasons, which is a, a different topic, uh, but it'd be a challenge just to introduce it for visa, you know, acquisition, um, rather than the whole academic piece. So Sanjay, you were about to speak, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, you know, I was just going to reiterate my, my earlier point is, is that the visa process is a way in which a student has to demonstrate um, that they and they alone are suitably able um, to firstly study in the United States and to then be able to, um, you know, um, I'm, I'm lost for words now, but uh, be able to continue to study in the United States for the duration of their program. That is what the visa interview is about. So anything that a student can do to enhance their case, they should do. Um, you know, if it is taking the SATs, um, the student should take the SATs to demonstrate that they're, you know, from an academic perspective, um, you know, they can make that leap to the U.S. education system uh, without problems. Uh, if they have to take the um, English proficiency examination, they should do that. Um, what students should not do is, um, you know, assume that by them being able to afford to study in the United States, um, they should be granted a visa because those are two different topics, don't speak to each other. Um, so they've got to, it's, it's all about academics. Um, they've got to be able to demonstrate that, that they can actually study in the United States and will add value to that, to that campus. Um, so that's important. Thank you for that. Now, mindful of our time, there are two more questions I'm going to try to squeeze in before we wrap up. So another question, and this was initially directed towards Ikenna, uh, you had mentioned that African students, um, you know, they have a focus on tuition costs or that we need to pay attention to that. Um, she works at, or um, Lacey works at a two-year technical college. They pride themselves on the affordability of tuition and a flexible application process, much like many other two-year colleges. Therefore, how do you think two-year colleges are, are, again, I know we touched on this a little bit, how are they perceived in Africa? How can they improve that understanding? And do you think the two plus two transfer agreements are, are well understood and how might that be improved uh, for those students? Yeah, a very, very good question um, from Lacey. So um, yeah, tuition costs, quite very important and community colleges or technical colleges tend to be 
very affordable. Um, but the challenge, especially if looking at it from the you know, West African part of view, um, you know, colleges are a big concern because the educational system in West Africa is built on universities. Parents went to universities, you know, four-year universities, traditional universities. So they always think my kids should also go to four-year um, traditional universities. Um, even um, just recently in Nigeria, um, the technical colleges called polytechnics were scrapped because um, the value of such technical um, education, you know, has lost its value. And so generally, you know, talking about colleges wouldn't be such an attractive thing for students, especially from Nigeria, West Africa, perhaps maybe different from other parts, you know, of Africa. But then uh, the two plus two, quite a very um, good way for, you know, students to be able to, you know, you know um, buffer the kind of um, costs that they will spend in education. However, we have also seen that some of these programs pose challenges for the visa because of the, um, in quotes, you know, progression. You know, the F1 visa is supposed to be for students to study and return back to the country. Then after your associate, de associate degree, you know, there's no clear cut, you know, progression of, you know, um, those students and they can defend that at the visa interview as to what would they do after the first two years. You know, um, so that's also a big challenge, you know, you know, for students for the two plus two. So a very good proposition, but then, you know, a little bit of um, very difficult ways to navigate that in, you know, in, in, in Africa. Okay, so the, the, the final question, it was very similar to a previous question about, you know, just how to improve those visa approval rates. So I think we, we've touched on that. One thing I did add, Sanjay, for um, your benefit is, you know, in the chat, I called it a, you know, a resource alert, but there's a country commercial guide that you can, you know, you click this link, you can look it up any country in, in the world. It's a great resource for understanding, you know, what is the, the feasibility, if you're doing a feasibility study about, you know, offering a new major, or if it's, if you're trying to understand what is the demand in this country for, for a particular program that we're offering, this is a great resource to help inform that process on your campus as you're deciding, you know, what you're going to market or what you're going to promote more, more specifically. Um, so definitely, please take advantage of the um, the country commercial guide. It's a great resource. Also, there's the you know Education USA's global guide, another fantastic resources for these for these purposes. Now, all of the questions everybody asked today were fantastic. There were great insights exchanged, and I'm, I'm sure I know I've learned a lot. I really hope everybody has learned a lot today. Now we have to, we've officially reached the end of our program. Once again, I'd like to thank Sanjay and Ikenna for joining us for today's Think In US event. Thank you both so much. On behalf of everyone in attendance, it was truly a pleasure um, to listen and learn from both of you. I'm sure we've done our fair share of, of taking down all of our notes and we have some action items. You're gonna get a flood of emails, Sanjay, asking to be part of the virtual tour program. Um, and we're excited to you know, just apply what we've learned uh, to the, the recruitment efforts of our respective institutions. So once again, thank you. Thank you to all of our participants who joined us today as well. We hope to see you again on our next MSM Think in US webinar. Uh, if there's ever a topic or theme that you'd like to see us address in more detail, um, again, please find me. I'm George Kasenga. You can find my email easily. I'll put it in the chat, uh, but send us those ideas. We wanna make sure we're being responsive to, to the needs and demands uh, of the audience. Uh, online events like this allow us to gather and work together and provide um, all the resources necessary so our students who are all here ultimately serving have as high quality and educational experience as possible. Uh, so again, thank you very much and I look forward to uh, seeing you all again next time and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you guys. Thanks everybody. Bye.